bless the Lord for the message and pray that he use it to minister unto each one here. <clears throat> There's two texts this morning. Uh, the topic, the title of the message is Waiting on the Lord. And there's two places that the Lord showed me that are precious and important. Psalm 130 we're going to read, but we're not going to come back to it. But Isaiah 30 we're going to come back to you maybe once or twice during the message. First Psalm 130, just this short psalm. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who should stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities so in this Psalm 130 we see Israel being the elect of God the Father that are redeemed back bought back with the blood of Christ from our iniquities from those actions that we took to try to justify ourselves before God we fell in Adam and in that process, all we are is darkness, and all we are is iniquitous. We can't do anything to save ourselves. God has to intervene. God has to come in, partly man, partly God, but completely the mediator, God-man, to take our sin on himself, our iniquities on himself, and to pay the penalty of thrice holy God the Father that demands that everyone that sins even once in your lifetime shall perish eternally. Christ took that on himself and bought us back with his blood. His body was broken and bruised for us, and we're made free based on his work on our behalf. Man can't save ourselves. We can't do a thing. All we'll do is sit our whole lives, deaf, dumb, and blind, and perish in our sin unless God intervene with the work of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the mediator. He's the one to look to. He's the one that redeemed us and bought us back unto God the Father and paid all our iniquitous works and duties. We're all paid for on his back. He took our stripes. He took our punishment on himself and we're made clean from his righteous works, from his obedience, from his goodness. We're made righteous and holy back to a good standing before the Father. It's the work of Christ that we're bought back, not man's works. Now turn to Isaiah 30. <clears throat> this is the main text. Isaiah 30. Man is so desperately wicked, we can't do a thing to justify ourselves, and all we can do is wait for God to save us. What can a dark and wicked, cre wicked creature do? Can we crawl up into heaven and make God save us? We can't do one thing, good or right, before God. How are we going to decide to save ourselves even? How are we going to even identify that we need to be saved? We can't do any of this. Isaiah 30, verse 18, God explains his purpose and his desire towards the elect. And therefore will the Lord wait. God Almighty is waiting to save his elect. There's a day of salvation for each and every one of his elect. And it's by his choice. It's by his will. It's his predetermined knowledge that he's decided the very second he puts his new heart within you. It's not man's will. It's not man's way. It's God that waits till he wants to save you, till he's decided to save you, that he may be gracious unto you. And therefore, Will he be exalted? If he saved you quickly, you'd take credit for it. You try to say that you lived your life good enough where God saved you because you were a good person. Nobody that's ever been saved would agree with that. That's a wicked concept. It has nothing to do with the God of glory that saves his people from their sins. He has determined the day, and you have to wait and shut up until he saved you that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord 
is a God of judgment. There must be judgment upon sinners. And by God's grace, he's judged all of his elect in his dear son and taken all our sin away. But you won't know that until the day that he wants to enlighten your soul with that knowledge. Blessed are all they that wait for him. Now you see that we have to wait on him. He's waiting so that you'll wait. And at the end of that, you'll see it was all God. It was 100% God. All I could do is mire around in my religious wickedness. I had no light, no understanding until God enlightened me, until he gave me a new heart. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. They shall weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry, because he's going to make you cry. He's going to cry from within you. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee to hear your cry that he puts within you, to cry for a new heart. He's already given you that new heart. That's why you cry for mercy, because you see your desperate, wicked state for the first time in your life. You see how doomed you are, and you agree with God. I might as well go to hell. I will go to hell lest God save me. If it's in his divine mercy, he'll, he will. If it's not, then I shall perish. I'd rather perish than defame Christ's name and act like it's my work that saved me. I'll shut up and wait because he is sovereign reigning ruler and he'll save who he will. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, that's waiting on God. That's saying you shut up and you wait until I save you. Yet shall not thy teachers be removed unto a corner anymore, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. You'll see that wait for what it is that you were shut up and know once you know God savingly, it's sure. And nobody can convince you otherwise. They can't threaten your life. They can't offer you enough money. You cannot be persuaded that you're outside of Christ once he's persuaded you and convince you that you're in Christ. Thine ears shall hear a word behind thee. This is why. You got a new mindset inside you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. When ye turn to the right hand and when ye turn to the left, ye shall defile also the covering of thy graven images of silver. All those things you used to take comfort in and rest in that were religious idols, things you did to try to justify yourself before God, you're gonna see what they are. This is called godly, holy repentance that you'll never walk away from. Once you see that all you were was an idolater before God, before he saved you, you'll not go back to it. You can't go back to it because you'll see those graven images as what they were. An ornament of thy molten images of gold. They used to be precious and alluring to you and tempting and desirous. But what are they after salvation? You're going to cast them away as a menstruous cloth. Your old heart, your old concept of who God is, is nothing but death on a cloth. Thou shalt say unto it, get thee hence. You'll have nothing to do with it anymore. You have the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've been given the new heart to see all those things you used to rest in are nothing but a menstruous cloth. And you'll not go back to that cloth. You'll have nothing to do with it. This is true salvation. This is what God does for his elect. But he waits in verse 18 so that you wait and you know in yourself the day that he actually does save you. There's no going back. I truly am saved. I know that I know God savingly. Point one, this is what God does to each one of his elect. Each one that fell in Adam, we wait. We wait for salvation and all the lifetime after a new heart. We wait on God for everything. We no longer trust the desires of our own heart. We've got a new heart that says, go this way, go that way, go the right way, go with God's word. Don't trust in your own understanding. Go to the word of God and get direction. Go to counsel. Proverbs, he says, wait on the Lord, he shall save thee. And in our text here this morning, blessed are they in verse 18 that wait. Everyone that waits on God, that doesn't walk away in the process, they're blessed of God. Nobody would ever wait unless we're given by his grace to wait on him. We'd all walk away if he 
he didn't wasn't merciful to us through the process. Verse 19b in our text, the voice of your cry, he's going to hear it. For God to hear your cries, for him to answer it simultaneous. He's given you to cry. He's answering and he's causing you to cry. And he hears it. For, turn to 1 John, please. New Testament, 1 John. Chapter 5. I want everybody here to know that they know Christ savingly. 1 John chapter 5, These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that ye may know that you have eternal life and that they and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God to actually to believe on the true Christ to rest on His righteous works is salvation. That's how you know that you know. This is the confidence that we have in Christ. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. At that moment of conversion, at that time when God gives you a new heart, when he opens your mouth to say, save me, I'm doomed. I am worthy of eternal torment. I'm wrong, you're right. At that very moment, he's being plenteous to you, kind to you, to give you the grasp that you're the problem and that Christ <laughs> is the only, only righteous one that can save you. Let's look at this again in Isaiah 65. Turn to Isaiah 65, please. Those that wait, those that wait, those of us that wait, labor in that way, it is excruciating. It is quite a process that God puts us through. He's waiting that he'd get all the glory and that we know once with no question in our minds that he was merciful through the whole process of waiting. He gave us to wait. Isaiah 65, verse 23. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. There's even hope for our children. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. God is promising to his bride, to the elect, to those that were in Christ before the foundation of the world, that fell in Adam, that were put back in Christ on the cross of Calvary, and our sins were paid for in the work of Christ on his body on the cross. For those of us that are in him, he's going to cause you to speak and he's going to hear you. He's going to cause you to call and he's going to cause you to know that you know him savingly. And it's that call that you know. Before that, you never opened your mouth under confession of faith. You never agreed with God that you were worthy of eternal torment. You thought some way or some means you weren't that bad. You didn't deserve an eternity and never ending punishment. You were pretty good. After salvation, call. You call on God. I am worthy of hell. Have mercy on me, a sinner. I will perish lest you pull me out of this pit of hell. I'm already in there. I fell in Adam and I'm doomed to it. If I breathe my last breath in this life, I'll scream the cries of the damned. God have mercy on my wicked soul. If you will, you can. You can. You can do everything. You're sovereign over my soul. You can save it. In all your darkness in this life, in your wait, wait on God. Don't walk away. Wait on this Christ. Point two is why, why should we wait on this Christ? Why should we? That was asked of the disciples after Christ preached an awesome message that he's the bread of life. 
that unless you eat his body and drink his blood, there's no hope for you. Many were offended with that. How can we do that? That's, an, that's not a work we can do. They walked away. And he looked to his disciples and said, you're going to walk away too? Simon Peter answered him and said, whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Christ is the one, the mediator, between God the Father and sinful, darkened, wicked men that fell in Adam that's able to save you from your sins. Where else shall I go? What other doctrine would I listen to? Go to another county, another country, another... There's no light there. Only darkness. It's just more of what I bring to the table. Sin and wickedness. You, Christ, have the words of life. From your very word, I see people confessing and agreeing with you. Coming to awareness that they're a sinner, that you're the Savior. That's what I need. I can't do it of myself. I'm helpless and hopeless. Turn to Matthew 11, please. This is about John the Baptist in his last days. John the Baptist was an amazing preacher. The only one in all the word that came to comprehension, salvation in the womb of his mother. Given to hear from the womb of his mother and understand and receive God's Holy Spirit in the womb of his mother in his whole his lifetime to know God savingly and to preach the gospel boldly. And to say, repent, leave your self-righteous wicked works and rest on the finished work of Christ alone. He's the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. He's the only one that can save you. There's no other means that God set forth that can save a wicked sinner. Christ is the single source, is what John the Baptist preached over and over his whole time. But in his last few hours on this earth, he had a hard go of it. Matthew 11, and it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of the community commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison, John was in prison, the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Aren't thou he that should come? Or do we look for another? John the Baptist was going through a doubt. He was going through a waiting on God in this life, tormenting inside himself, questioning Yet he preached the holy gospel for years. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. That Christ is the mediator. He is very God in human flesh. And he gave the blind to receive their sight, the lame to walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are even raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in Christ. These items are precious, and Christ spoke these words when he was on this earth so that you can hear it today, 2,000 years later, and that he put life into his elect through this message. The blind received sight was in John 9. It's in your outline. I am the light of the world is what Christ told him at that time. When Christ said this, he spat on the ground and made clay. There was a blind person right in front of him. And anointed the eyes of the blind person with this clay and spit and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. That means scent. Siloam is the pool of scent. That man went. He came seeing. Christ gave him his sight. The lame would walk. It's in John 5. You remember this when there was a pool where an angel would come down out of heaven and stir that water. And everybody that would... In the first person that would touch that water that was stirred up would be healed of whatever sickness they had. And this man was sitting there 38 years waiting. And Jesus walked up to him and said, Wilt thou be made whole? And that crippled man said, I have no ability. I have no man. I, I, the water gets stirred and I, I go to move that way and somebody beats me to the water and they get healed, not me. Christ said, rise, take up thy bed, walk. 
His very words healed him. This isn't a man. This is God, man, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the mediator. This is the one to rest on. Whether you're doubting your salvation or you don't know if you've ever been saved, wait on this one. He speaks life into his people. Lepers were cleansed also. When Christ came down out of the mountain, there was a leper there worshiping him. And he was just saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. He was convinced in himself that this wasn't just a preacher. This was very God in human flesh. You can make me clean. It's whatever your will is. Jesus said, I will. Be thou clean. Immediately, the leprosy was gone. The deaf here, this one is amazing. They brought a deaf person to Christ and he had an impediment also. Couldn't speak correctly. Jesus put his fingers in his ears and spit, touched his tongue and looked up to heaven and sighed and said unto him, Be opened. Straightway the ears were open, string of his tongue was loose, and he spake plainly. This is God in human flesh. It's able to save you from your sin. He's fully competent to take your sin from you. Cry unto him, have mercy on me. If it be thou will, if it's your desire, save me. Even the dead were raised up. When he approached Lazarus' grave, he said, take the stone away. And they said, he's been dead four days. It reeks. No. Christ said, you don't understand. I am the resurrection. He said, Lazarus, come forth. What Walked out of that tomb. Lazarus, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. Nothing. Man has no ability to be resurrected in ourselves. Christ, all the ability. He just spoke it and it happens. Because he's God. And the poor have the gospel preached unto him. Look at this in Luke 4, please. Luke chapter 4 is the awesome time in Christ's ministry when he went back to his hometown. <clears throat> Luke chapter 4, verse 15. Christ taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. There was delivered unto him the book of the prophet of Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to poor. Now he defines Christ from his word and from his very mouth in front of these people. He defines what poor is. Heal the brokenhearted. Those that find out that they're lost in their lifetime. Find out that they're doomed, lest God save them. You ever been brokenhearted? I pray God break your heart. To preach deliverance to the captives. Are you held captive by the power of Satan that you trust your own works to save yourself? This is what this is the poor. Recovering of the sight to the blind. The only way light comes into the body is through the eye. It's the only way. We're born blind, darkened. Inside our body is no light. Christ has all the ability to give you that light and to put his spirit within you so that you can see that you're the sinner and he's the savior. And to set at liberty them that are bruised. We are bruised so badly by the fall of Adam. It's, we're perishing our sin lest God save us. These are the poor, the ones that find out that they're brokenhearted, that they're held captive by their own wicked iniquity, that they're blind, they have no light in them, and that they're bruised, they're going to hell, lest God save them. And he's going to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, that there's a specific time when he's going to come and live and die for his saints, and he's going to put his life into you. He's going to charge to you his righteousness. He closed the book and gave it again to the minister, sat down. Eyes of all of them were upon him, just blown away. He said that in a way we've never heard before. Some of them recite. Some of them saw that they were doomed, that they were poor by God's grace. And he said, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. I am arrived on the scene. I, my father promised I'd come. 
I promised in my father I'd buy back the elect, and I'm here right now on this earth. I'm the mediator. I'm the only means of salvation, and I save who I will, the, who the father elected inside me before the foundation of the world. All those that fell in Adam, I'm putting back inside myself and saving them on the cross of Calvary. And also in Matthew 11, he says, And blessed to John the Baptist is he whomsoever shall not be offended in me. Turn to Mark 8 to see this. If Mark 8 is where God explains what he was telling John the Baptist. Verse 34, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Christ is saying, you cannot stay religious. You cannot stay in your old manner. The menstrual cloth stinks. You will have nothing to do with it once you see that you're the sinner. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. You think that you're good in and of yourself? That's a sick, wicked smell of death. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's sake, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of Christ and of my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in glory of his Father with the holy angels. Christ is saying, when I come back and gather up all mine elect, all mine elect are going to have nothing to do with the false gospel, with the false message, with their own menstrual cloth. They don't want anything to do with it anymore. They know that the worldly desires and the worldly lusts, the things that they are raised in, the things that they used to take comfort in, are nothing before holy God. They'll have nothing to do with it. They lose all that. They hate it. They despise it because now they love Christ savingly. So point three, where's your mind? Where's your mind? <clears throat> Is your mind on your own free will? your own lusts, your own desires, your own opinion of who you build God to be from a bunch of different concepts around you? Or are you resting on the true Lord and Savior, the one that preached to John the Baptist, rest on my finished work. Don't trust your works. Don't follow your own heart. Follow God's word. Turn to Isaiah 59, please. Isaiah 59. <laughs> Be ready to flip back to our text in Isaiah 30 if you kept your finger there. So is your mind waiting on God? <clears throat> Isaiah 59, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. God will not hear unless he cause you to cry unto him. He won't hear until that appointed day of salvation for each one of his elect. I read it in our text. Turn back to Isaiah 30. Verse 18 of Isaiah 30. And therefore will the Lord wait until then he doesn't hear a thing. From God hating rebels, from God hating sinners, nothing. No consideration, no respect of persons. It doesn't mean a thing. You're lost and dead in your sin. You have no ability to cry out to God and save yourself. You have to wait until he save you. And he says it in Isaiah 30, verse 18. Will the Lord wait and that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted? He alone is going to get 100% of the credit for salvation because he's waiting for the day that he puts a new heart in you. And then what's going to happen? You're going to wait on him. 
end of verse 18. You'll wait on him and you'll just say like these beggars that were just stricken with blindness and deafness, if you will, save me. If you will, it's your will, not mine. I have no free will. You're the only one that can do anything about my lost estate. God, be merciful to me. Hebrews 11, 6. We're not going to turn there, but it is in your outline. This is where it's at. This is the common denominator for everybody that's ever come to know Christ savingly. Without faith, without God-given ability to rest and to believe on Christ, you can't please God. You can't come to God. You can't even cry for mercy lest He give you the new heart within that believes and rests on Christ's merit and that knows your own self-righteousness is just a filthy rag. Once God gives you this new heart, you know that He's the rewarder of them that diligently seek Him, and you will go about your whole life seeking God's will for you, resting on His finished work and relying on His righteousness instead of your own. So turn to Ephesians to close this message, please. Ephesians in chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, there's all kinds of despicable things mentioned in verse 3. We all had our conversation in times past with the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as everybody around about us. Doomed. But God, who is rich in mercy, here's the one to go to in time of need. He's rich, rich, rich in mercy. For his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, during that whole time of our life that we couldn't cry and didn't cry and didn't want anything to do with God, just darkness in us. During that whole time, we were dead in sins. Then he quickened us together with Christ. By grace you saved, unearned favors, nothing that I ever did. He visited me, dead on the roadside. He came and put his heart in me, and now I see him for who he is and in myself as a sinner. He raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's Christ's work on the cross of Calvary that's recommended, recommended us back to a good standing before the Father. We're made whole based on his work. That in the ages to come, he might show the ages to come is eternity. If you've never seen that before. For all eternity, that God's going to be able to say, grace and kindness towards God-hating sinners through Christ Jesus. For by grace were you saved, through faith. And that faith, it wasn't of yourself. It was the gift of God, lest a man would boast about it. It had to be by grace. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Christ's good works, His obedience on the cross of Calvary, His righteousness is charged to us now. And we're reconciled back to the Father, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We're held in good standing with God the Father, perfect and acceptable, all because of Christ's work on our behalf. And he asks within the bodies of his elect during their lifetime, and some an hour before death, like the thief on the cross. Remember what Christ told the thief on the cross? This hour you'll be with me in paradise. That man was given holy repentance one hour before he died. His personality was so aggressive and so contrary to God and so full of spite and hate that he had to be hung on a cross for the crimes he committed next to the Lord and Savior that laid down his life for him on the cross. And hear the gospel message from Christ that gave him life. And to know that he's doomed and going to hell and he agreed, I deserve every bit of eternal torment. But if you would, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Christ said, I'll remember you. This very hour will you be with me. It's nothing that man did, and it's nothing you did, and it's nothing that any of, our, of the elect ever have done to save themselves. It's all God's will that we're made whole based on Christ's work.